we almost take our cabling infrastructure for granted. We plug in our cables, and it works. But obviously, the cable is where everything starts and everything ends. It's an incredibly important part of our infrastructure. So we have to make sure that we're using exactly the right kinds of cable for what we're doing. And when we're building out a new infrastructure, you really only get one shot at this. If you put in cable for your entire building, you don't have a lot of chances to go back, rip it all out, and put new cabling in again. It's a very labor-intensive process, and it's a very expensive process. So when you first put it in, it's first installed, you want to make sure that you're doing exactly the right thing and you're buying the right type of cable for your requirements. Even in our mobile networks with our mobile phones and everywhere that we're going back and forth with our cell phones, we're still ultimately connecting to a wired network. There's still going to be cables that are used even in those very large wireless networks. The only time where you really don't have worldwide communication with some type of cable is probably with an amateur radio operator that's sending information over Morse code or communicating via voice or even via digital signals all over wireless networks. But for the rest of us, we have to think about the type of cable that's being used, whether we're on a wireless network or a wired network. Coaxial cables are named because there is two or more forms of a common axis that's being used. You can see in a coax cable, you have that single copper wire running right through the middle. That is your coax right through the center of that particular cable. And we've been using cable like this for a long time, for years and years, tens of years with networking, because there's TenBase 5, which we used to call ThickNet. There's RG8U, which was used for TenBase 2, and even ThinNet, which is an RG58, a much thinner coaxial cable. These days, we see this type of coaxial cable being used on our cable television that's coming into our house. For the people that still have copper connections for that, you can also send those cable modem signals through this cable. So now this is becoming one of the most popular networking types out there is using something like this coax. And if you were to cut this open and look at it, you would see that the copper conductor, the, the actual wire that everything is running over, is right there in the middle of the coax cable. Wrapped around that is an insulator so that you don't have anything that can interfere with that signal going over your copper wire. Wrapped around that is usually a metal shield to protect it, because usually we're putting these coax cables in the ground. They're in environments that are not on the inside of a building. They're on the outside of a building. And because of that, we also wrap a plastic jacket around that to protect it. So even though we're not using thick net cables or thin net cables for our ethernet, we're still taking advantage of these coaxial type networks so that we can bring those cable modem signals directly into our facility. Another type of copper cabling is the twisted pair cable. If you've ever taken your Ethernet connection and broken it apart and looked at it, it will come out as many different twisted wires inside of this single sheath. We call this a balanced mode operation, which means that there are two wires, and each wire has an equal and opposite set of signals going through it. So you've got, if you look at the specifications for this wiring, a transmit plus side and a transmit minus side. And there's also a receive plus side and a receive minus side. It's this twist and this difference between these signals that really is the secret in this twisted pair cabling. That's why there are so many twists in this cable. As it's passing by interference, your interference is going to be closest to only one of those, and it's going to be constantly changing. So we can look at the other end once we received the signal, compare what we see across both of those wires, and minimize the amount of interference that's coming across that link. Another thing you'll notice about this picture is that even within the same cable, there are different twist rates in each one of these pairs. So the tightest twist rates are on some of these other cables. You can see there are looser twist rates on others. That way, none of these cables is going to interfere with the other, or at least will have a minimum amount of interference, because each one of those pairs is using a different twist rate all the way through the cable. With twisted pair cabling, we tend to have two different kinds, a shielded twisted pair and an unshielded twisted pair. 
With shielded twisted pair, we have an extra set of metal shielding that goes around each one of those twisted pairs going through. So you can have that extra blocking of interference that might come through. If you have an environment that's noisy, there's a lot of equipment, there's a lot of radio signals, you might need to get a shielded twisted pair to minimize the amount of interference that might go across. And usually there is a grounding wire built right into the shielded twisted pair that you'll need to ground on both sides of this. A more common type of twisted pair cabling is the unshielded twisted pair. It's obviously less expensive than the shielded twisted pair because you don't have all that extra shielding built into the wire itself. And it's the kind that you would use if you were plugging in an Ethernet connection at your desk, maybe in a small office, or even in the core of a corporate network. Everything tends to run over this unshielded twisted pair. You usually only use the shielded twisted pair if there's a particular kind of interference that you're looking to avoid. And so whenever you're working with almost anything in your networking infrastructure that deals with this copper cabling, it almost always is going to be this unshielded twisted pair.